We've been looking at some messages in dealing with eschatology, the end times. If there's anything that I'm more and more and more convinced about, it is this. That we should not fear eschatology. It is a subject that some people would avoid. Perhaps some folks in reform circles would have a tendency to avoid this. But I am increasingly convinced of this. That if we look at eschatology right, we are going to find that a proper study of the end times is going to magnify Christ immensely. And in fact, any eschatology, any study of the end times that doesn't accomplish that end is, is to not view the end in the right fashion. Last things. Study of eschatology. This is part four. I've entitled it, One New Man in Place of the Two. One new man in place of the two. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Christ, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption. Now, I just want to stop right here. There's an emphasis in Ephesians that I want you to feel that perhaps you don't feel right now. Notice verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Who's speaking? Who is this writing? Paul. Paul is a saved Jew. Who is he writing to? Ephesians, a church largely made up of converted Gentiles. Notice this. Who has blessed us. Me and you. Notice the pronouns. God has blessed you Gentile Christians and me, a Jewish Christian, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We both have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as He chose us, both Jew and Gentile, in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons, both of us, You and me, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Notice, there's a lot of according to the purposes of His will. There's a lot that has to do in in this, this letter to the Ephesians that has to do with what God's purpose is to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. Paul does not... Paul is not content here to simply say, you, this is what God has done for you. There are places in Scripture where he does that, but not here. Why? Because the us is absolutely essential to the argument that he is making in the Ephesian letter. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ. What is this mystery of His will? What is His purpose that He has set forth in Christ? 
as a plan for the fullness of time. What is this all about? Uniting all things in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. Now, in the ESV, verse 10, a plan. King James Version says dispensation. You know, a lot of times when we think about dispensation, we think about dispensationalism. And we think about lengths of time where God deals in a certain way with certain people. But listen, that's not what the, you don't want to think a time period here. Dispensation means this to dispense. That's the idea. It, it, it's literally God managing. It's like managing a household. You don't want to think so much a dispensation of time as much as God dispensing His purpose. Managing His purpose. It's a plan. It's God carrying out His plan. It's Him administering, overseeing. This is a plan for the fullness of time. What's the fullness of time? Paul doesn't leave us in the dark about that. In the Galatian letter, he says this, he says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The fullness of time is God sending. That fullness of time comes when God sends His Son into the world, born of a woman, born under the law. So, here's the plan. Here's the plan of God. In the fullness of time, God sends forth His Son into this world. The plan and purpose of the living God is that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would do something. Do you know what He does? He unites. The purpose of His coming is to unite. That's what it says. Unite in Himself all things in heaven and on earth. Well, if you're even half as curious as I am, what's that? All things in heaven and on earth? What are, what are those things? What are the all things? What things are in heaven? What things are on earth? Well, it's, it's whatever it is. It's what he's uniting. Thankfully, the Apostle Paul has every intention of not leaving us in the dark about this. Brethren, I'm going I'm to take you through a quick overview of this. But I'm going to tell you right up front what these all things are. The all things in heaven and the all things on earth are people. They're the redeemed. But you know what's interesting? You don't want to just think of Him uniting us who are down here with those that are up there. Or where heaven is right through the veil. That's, that's not what you want to think. What you want to see here is this. Think about when this was written. When was it written? First century. You know, when this was written, think about the saints in heaven. Who, I mean, Paul's alive. Paul was alive when Christ was alive. Here it is right at the beginning. Here it is right at the fullness of time when Christ had come into the world. By and large, who populated heaven? Jews. Oh, brethren, the Old Testament saints were by and large the ones in heaven. And do you know who by and large were the saints here? Paul, Paul gives us this argument in the Roman letter. The Jews, they had a law. They, weren't, they were not achieving the righteousness of God, which is by faith. They were seeking the righteousness of God. Yes, there was a remnant of them. Yes, there were. Yes, the disciples were Jewish. But by and large, brethren, 
the redeemed that were here on earth at the time of the writing of this letter, by and large, it's the Gentiles. That's what you want to see here. The main emphasis is not simply bringing those together who are still alive with those who have died and gone before us. It's the idea of Jew and Gentile. You say, how do you know that? Well, watch as we develop this. Watch as we move through here. This is Jesus Christ uniting Jews and Gentiles together in Himself. And this has everything to do with eschatology. But more on that later. Right now I want you to see Paul expound and explain. Because here's the thing. He gives us in summary fashion right here, Christ uniting all things in in heaven and on earth. This is the plan of God. He gives it to us in a summary fashion, but as he moves through the letter, he's going to unpack this. He's going to expound this reality to us. Let's watch as he does this. Notice Notice. Well, here's. Let me just tell you what happens before I ask you to notice this. I'm going to have you look at it in a second. What happens is, in chapter two, he really unpacks this for us. But moving from his summary statement in verses nine and ten of chapter one to getting to unpacking this in chapter two. He first wants them to see something about God's power. Notice this in Ephesians 1.18. Having the eyes of your hearts. Paul is praying for them. He wants, you see, he's getting ready to unpack this, but before he does, he wants to pray for them. He's given them in summary form. This is what Christ has come to do. He's come in the fullness of time. God's plan is going to be unraveled here. And He's going to unite things in heaven, things on earth. I'm going to explain this to you. I'm going to expound this to you. But before I do, I want to pray for you. And my prayer for you is that you might have your heart, the eyes of your hearts enlightened. That you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. He wants us to be grounded in that hope. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? See, this is not just disjointed. Paul always has purpose. Paul is very exact. He's very, he's very specific in his argument. He builds. He doesn't waste words. He doesn't waste sentences. He wants us to grasp what is this immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Where does Paul behold the working of God's great might? Where does he see this power? I'll tell you this, it's precisely in Jesus Christ uniting the things in heaven and the things on earth. This is where the power is displayed. You say, how so? Well, I'll tell you this, there are two massive obstacles to you and I as Gentiles being made people of God and being made participants with the people of God. Two major obstacles that the power of God obliterates to bring us into this position where we are one with the saints. Where we are united with those largely Jews. The saints of the Old Testament. Maybe it's hard to see the connection. And I'm going to show you what he has in mind. Brethren, what he's all about here is how do you explain Jews and Gentiles falling down and worshiping before the same, before the same God? We might think this is a small matter. Paul does not think so. Paul sees this as a demonstration of God's exceeding Great power. The same kind of power that raises Jesus Christ from the dead. Brethren, here's an immeasurable greatness of God's power. What does it do? 
What does it do? Well, now here's the thing about it. Paul says it's toward. It's toward us who believe. Do you see that? It's toward us. It has direction. It's like when you fire a bullet or a car goes down the road or a river flows. It has trajectory. It has direction. The power of God is not just indiscriminately thrown out all over the place. People talk about the common grace of God. I'm not denying that God doesn't do good things for even lost people. But I want you to know this. There is an immeasurable greatness of God's power akin to that which raised Christ from the dead that gets pointed directly at every true believer. And it does something. What does it do? What does it do? It has direction. It comes toward us. God takes aim. The target is the believer. All this power culminates on us. And He's speaking specifically to these Gentiles. He wants them to see how in His argument He's going to show us. He is specifically interested in how Gentiles are made the people of God. You'll see that in chapter 2. Brethren, what does this power do in the believer? That is the question. Paul tells us what it does. He immediately transitions. He tells us about this power here in Ephesians chapter 1. And then, and then what does he do? It's, well, it's that power that worked in Christ. And he wants to tell us about Christ being raised and He raised up from the dead and seated in the heavenly places and far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, all things are put under His feet. The church is the fullness of Him. But now He's going to elaborate on what this power does. Oh, brethren, there are two massive obstacles in the way to Gentiles becoming the people of God. And chapter 2 deals with both obstacles. If you have a Bible that separates into sections, gives you headings, you will notice that Ephesians 2 is divided into two sections. Notice the structure of chapter 2. The first half and the second half have basically the same structure. First, you get the obstacle described that God's power has to overcome That obstacle that prevents us from coming to God. And then you get the manner in which God obliterates that obstacle. Notice the construction. Chapter 2, verse 1. You were. Notice when you go down to verse 12. Remember that you were. In both in the first half and in the second half, Paul wants us to remember something about the way we were. And something about the way we were is the huge obstacle that keeps us from God. And notice how both times he talks about how you were in verse 4, but God. In verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus. You see, there's a you were, but... Here's the remedy. Here's how God's power has remedied that obstacle that was preventing your coming. Let's notice these obstacles. I mainly want to deal with the second one. But let's notice the first one before we jump to the second one. The first obstacle is your spiritual condition. As a lost Gentile, there may be some of you sitting here that are going to deny this. But I want to tell you something. The condition of every single person in this world, the condition of every single Gentile, the condition of the people in San Antonio, the condition of you before you became a Christian, this if you are a Christian, if you're not a Christian, this describes you now. This is not talking about the guys that, that partied all night, shot up drugs, this morning are hungover, couldn't even think about opening their eyes to come to church. This is not talking about them. This is talking about the religious people that fill churches today as well as those guys that can't get out of bed. This is dealing with everybody that does not know Christ. This is dealing with every non-Christian. Look at the condition. It's not a pretty one. This is one of the most graphic descriptions of fallen man found in the Scriptures. We need to take note of it. 
You were dead in the trespasses and sins. Dead in sin. Men may feel alive, but they are dead. They are dead in the way that matters most. They are dead to God. They are dead in trespasses. Trespasses, trespassing a boundary that God has set up. They're dead in trespassing those boundaries. They're dead in sin. Sin is lawlessness. They're just they're rebels against God and they're dead in it. They swim in that water. They swim in that ocean. That's all they do. They may do moral things, but it is still not acceptable to God because it is so tainted with their self and their pride and their lack of love to God. Dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You, want, you just walk there following the course of this world. You're just floating, floating along. Following the prince of the power of the air. The devil's your leader. You may not think so. But it's because you're deceived. The Spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Just ripe for wrath. Paul reminds them of what they were. But now, now they are not that. Well, what changed? How did they go from being what they were to no longer being what they were to being what they are now? Notice verse 4. Here is God's immeasurably great power that raised Christ from the dead. Here it is being directed toward a lost Gentile. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ That's what He did. He brings us to life. He regenerates us. And Paul's using these plural pronouns again. The the Jew has to experience this just as much as a Gentile. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we are. This, This is the only way to God. It is life. And God does this. God exercises His power. It's not something we do. God does this. But God, it is His mercy. It is His love. Even when we were dead. We were dead. We had no power. We had no life to be able to do what needed to be done. We were dead in our trespasses. And God steps in and He makes us alive together with Christ. And it's by His grace. Powerful demonstrations of that which you and I do not deserve. That's how we're saved. Made alive, raised up with Christ. Seated with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you go down to verse 10, He he makes us alive. Workmanship. He goes to work on us. He gives us life. He makes us into those who in Christ Jesus are workers of good works. We don't get saved by the good works, but He makes us into the workers of good works. God is the One prepares beforehand that we should walk in them. Beforehand. Before what? Before we're even saved, God has determined that He is going to save us and bring us to life that we should no longer walk where? Where did we walk before? We walked before following the course of this world. We walked before dead in trespasses and sins. Now where do we walk? Not there anymore. Following the prince of the power of the air? Not there anymore. Now we walk somewhere else. But this is all God's doing. We are His workmanship. He did this. It's by His mercy. It's by His grace. It's by His power. It's by His love. This is the the first obstacle that God deals with. Our spiritual condition. But notice this. This is where I'm going. This, This has all been preliminary. Notice this. The second obstacle in verse 11. This is not our spiritual condition. 
It's our spiritual standing. Verse 11, Therefore remember, remember. You see, He called them before. He doesn't use remember before, but He definitely is calling them to remember that they had been dead in trespasses and sins. They had been children of wrath, sons of disobedience like the rest of mankind. He wants them to remember again something else about their past. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles... See, he. If you've had any question about whether it's Gentiles that he's really been thinking about here, especially these Ephesians, and how they are made partakers, here it is. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you think back to what you were. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is not our spiritual condition. This is our spiritual standing. This is where we are. Not so much who we are, but where we are. These are positional realities. Notice verse 11. You Gentiles in the flesh, that's what you are by nature. Remember what the Jews, the circumcision, remember what they called you. Why would he have them remember that? Why say that to them? Why say to the Ephesian Christians, remember what the Jews called you? Make no mistake about it. For a Jew to call you uncircumcised. He was was not congratulating you. He was not commending you. And He was not simply just stating a truth to you that He was neutral about. Folks, when a Jew called a Gentile uncircumcised, it was derogatory. Listen to this. David said to the men who stood by, this is Goliath. He's out there taunting Israel. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I'll tell you, when Stephen looked at those religious leaders and he said to them, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised of heart. Listen, when you call the Jew uncircumcised, I'll tell you, that was not received well. They killed him. Why? Because calling them a name like that was the kind of thing to provoke a person to kill you. That's that's the kind of defamation that was behind this word. Listen to this. Even in the book of Acts, chapter 11, Peter goes up to Jerusalem. The circumcision party criticized Peter, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. That's a criticism. They're not applauding him. Good job, Peter. We're thankful you're out there evangelizing the Gentiles. They criticized Him. You ate with Gentiles! You you ate not just with Gentiles. You ate with the uncircumcised. Like That's horrific, Peter! How could you do that? Hey, I'll tell you, Peter doesn't say, I am glad to be an apostle out there to the Gentiles. You know what he says? Guys, I wouldn't have done it if God had not made it real obvious that I should do it. 
he's almost wanting to say, don't blame me. Blame God. I, I wouldn't have done it. This is criticism. Ephesians 2.11, think about what's happening here. Paul is saying to Gentiles like us, remember what Jews called you. Remember how in times past the Jewish people dealt with you as outsiders. They dealt with you, they dealt with you in a way to show that there is a massive barrier between Jew and Gentile. That's how they dealt with you. Paul is saying, remember how the Jews treated you and what they called you. Brethren, it's amazing to me that even the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember this, He's dealing with that, that woman, Canaanite woman, Syrophoenician woman. She's got a daughter that has a demon. And what does He say to her? He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. You say, wait, if anybody's going to be kind to the Gentiles, dogs? He, I mean, brethren, you can't miss it. He called her a dog. And she doesn't take offense. She just recognizes, he can call me a dog, but he's my only hope. And I'm not going anywhere else. Lord, even the dogs, they're looking for the crumbs. You can be certain that woman is not being a called a dog anymore. You see, what, what Paul wants is for these Gentile believers to be blown away by the amazing power of God and what it's done for them. That's what He wants. Brethren, if we're really going to get excited about our salvation, we need to remember what we were. We need to remember how things were. We need to grasp what the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead actually has done when it's directed towards Gentiles. Like us. If you want to realize and recognize the greatness of God's power, then you, have to, you just have to grasp the magnitude of the obstacles that stood in the way. Here it is. He's saying separation, division, disunity. God overcomes that. As Gentiles, we were dogs. We were the uncircumcision. Separate from Jews, despised by those who called Jews. But it's worse than this. Look at verse 12. We're talking about position. Yes, we're at odds. We're not in the same place with the Jews according to the flesh. We see by what they call us. There's separation. There's obstacle. There's barrier. but ethnic Jews are not our biggest problem. See where we were. This is about where we were. Our place. Remember that you were at that time. That time when the Jews called you uncircumcised. Remember where you were. You were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Do you see where we were? Our place was a place away from Christ. Where did we stand? Where were we? Away from Israel away from the covenants of promise, away from hope, away from God. I know we may have ideas when we were lost Gentiles about who God was, but we dreamt up a God of our own imagination. We may have been close to that God, but we were not close to the God of Scripture. We were far away do you want to know what defines us in our lost state as Gentiles? Far away. 
That's what he says in verse 13. Far off. Far away. Christless. Countryless. Promiseless. Hopeless. Godless. Brethren, you've got to recognize what we were. You see lost people out there. It's not a small thing. Or if you're in here, you got to recognize where you are. This is where you are. This is right where you are. What sort of power can remedy this? It takes nothing less than the immeasurable greatness of God's power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Why? Why? Because we were cemented in this place far off by our sins. Your sins planted you there and you were immovable. No power in this world could move you from there. It took resurrection power to move you off that place. That's the issue. Brethren, I'll tell you, Paul shows us. You can say, oh, this is this this seems negative. I tell you, if you're ever going to really appreciate your salvation, you have to remember where you came from. That makes it all the more glorious. But, what of the cure? Paul spells it out in crystal clear fashion in verse 13. But now. Oh, before it was but now. But God. But God. Mm, Rich in mercy. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Brethren, the imagery that Paul may have in his mind here is very likely the imagery of the temple. Think the temple had walls and curtains and barriers. If you know about the temple, having access to God, the innermost place, the Shekinah glory, was in the Holy of Holies. But move out from there. You have the holy place. Move out from there. You have the court of the priests. Move out from there. You have the court of Israel. Move out from there. You have the court of the women. Move out from there. Do you know what the outermost court was? The court of the Gentiles. Josephus tells us that in Latin and in Greek, there were warning signs into the court of the women. From the court of the Gentiles, there were warning signs in two languages. The languages of the Gentiles. They were warning signs that warned of your death if you pass through there. And I'll tell you this, the Romans granted the Jews the right to put to death anybody that crossed that barrier, even if they were a Roman citizen. This is the very thing Paul was charged with. You know, when he was running around Jerusalem with some Greeks, when they apprehended him, they accused him of this very thing, of taking Greeks, Gentiles, into the temple. This is probably the imagery that Paul has in mind. Gentiles are far off. There's barriers. You cannot enter. You cannot come near. Brethren, do you see the contrast? Notice the contrast. Far off, brought near. This is an extreme 
contrast. There is an absolute difference between what you were and what you are now. And you need to recognize this. Notice verse 18. This being brought near, it's nothing less than being brought into the Holy of Holies. Do you see what has happened in verse 18? You have been granted access to the very Father of glory. The Father of lights. You have access. Brethren, far off, near, those are positional identities. Those have to do with measurements. Can I tell you far off and near? The measurement has to do with the very person of God Himself. Brethren, the contrast here is all about our relationship with God. Brethren, when you go from being a lost Gentile to being a saved Christian, it is not a small thing. The contrast is extreme. Brethren, do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? Have you drawn near to God? That's what's being said here. That's what's being granted. That is the obstacle that God removes. You have access into the Holy of Holies. That's what that rent veil was all about. That's the extreme contrast. It's possible to tell if we're Christians now. How? Well, there is a then there's a way we were then, and there is a now. Then, you were far off. Now, you've been brought near. Near to what? Through Christ, we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. This is His power. This is what it does. It removes the barrier, the obstacle to coming into the Holy of Holies itself. The Shekinah. Near, far. That's the comparison. This is all measured with respect to our relationship with God. Now notice this. Verse 14. Christ Himself is our peace who has made us both one. Brethren, do you remember all the way back there? Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Jesus has come to fulfill the very plan or the dispensation of God in this fullness of time. And what is it to do? It's to unite. Unite! Do you see it here? Made us both one. Who's the us? He's including Himself. He's talking Jew and Gentile. This is what was going on back there in verse 11. You have Gentiles in the flesh. They're called the uncircumcision. They're called that by the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. You've got Jew. You've got Gentile. You've got obstacles. You've got two people at odds. They're calling people names. Derogatory names. You've got the dogs. You've got the people who ethnically anyways in the, in the whole purposes of God were, were designated as His people. These are the people to whom covenants are entrusted and the oracles of God who had the prophets from whom the Messiah would come. There's division between them. There's not peace. There's not harmony. And they're far off from God. But He's uniting. Do you see it here? Who has made us both one. How this mighty power of God has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Laws! The Moabites can't come in. The Amalekites can't come in. The Amorites can't come in. And even the best of the Gentiles, you stay out beyond those signs. If you enter in even to where the, the Jewish women go, it is your head. You stay out there, you dogs. There's separation. God said, you don't marry. You don't intermarry with them. You don't eat their food. 
There was separations to keep this messianic line pure. There was separations. There were laws and there were ordinances that separated. But what has happened? He's broken down in His flesh. Christ in His body. He's broken this down by His body. The dividing wall of hostility. Do you see that? You've got Jew. You've got Gentile. You've got a wall between them. They're hostile to each other. These commandments, these ordinances, abolished that He might create in Himself one new man. One new man. God doesn't have two different people of God. There's one new man in place of the two. God takes the Jew, the Gentile, and He makes peace. So making peace. That's the issue with Jew and Gentile. The issue with God, no God, no hope, no Christ. You look at the next verse. He reconciles both Jew and Gentile to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing that hostility hostility that God has towards us. But brethren, I want you to think back to verses 14 and 15. Our Lord Jesus Christ is said to create. Not like He created in the beginning where He made everything out of nothing. Here He takes what's dead. What's dead, defiled, sinful, rotten, wrathful, disobedient, followers of the devil. He takes bad material and He creates. He takes them and it's like He brings them both together and creates a new humanity. That's the picture that you have here. In Himself. That's His raw material. Sinful Jews, sinful Gentiles, Notice verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who are far off, Gentiles. Peace to those who are near, Jews. One Gospel. He takes two peoples. He makes them one people. Those who are near, the Jew. Those who are far off, the Gentiles. And He creates in Himself one new man in place of the two. This is what He said. Unite Unite all things in heaven and on earth in Himself. This is what's happening. This is the uniting. One new humanity. But here's the thing you do not want to miss. Do not miss this. Brethren, when we were far off, we were separated from Christ. Notice how He says this. You were far off. You were, yes, we were being called uncircumcision. We were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope, without God. But now, none of it's true. None of that is true. That's why you say, but. It's in contrast to. That's how you were, but that is not how you are anymore. But now, you who are far off, characterized by thy, those five points of separation that you find in verse 12 are brought near. So now, having been brought near, none of those things in verse 12 are true. The power of God has overcome each one of them. We are not separated from Christ. Right? Brethren, what does verse 13 say? Now, What? In Christ. We're not separated from Christ. We are in Christ. We're not aliens to the commonwealth of Israel anymore. But what does verse 19 say? Are we any longer strangers and aliens? No. What are we now? Fellow citizens. That's what commonwealth has to do with. Commonwealth has to do with citizenship in. 
we're not without a country anymore. In fact, what country are we now not alien to? The commonwealth of Israel. We're fellow citizens. Not two people. Not two countries. One. One new humanity. Oh, brethren, the covenants of promise, are we separated from those? No, brethren, what we are told here is that He's made us both one in His flesh. Actually, what He tells us before this is He says that in Christ Jesus, you were who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know what Jesus says about that blood? This is the blood of the new covenant. Brethren, this blood that has brought us together is the blood of the covenant. It's the blood that seals these covenants to us. That covenant, the new covenant is ratified by His blood. We're partakers. It's His blood that's brought us together. Are we without hope? <laughs> without hope? Brethren, it says we've been reconciled to God. It says we have access to God. It says we're fellow citizens with the saints. It says we're members of His household. Members of His family. Does that leave you without hope? Brethren, that, what greater hope do you want than to have God and have access to God? <clears throat> and if that's not it, brethren, when you get to the end of this chapter, you can see in verse 21 and 22, we're being joined together. We grow into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You also. You Gentiles are in there too. You're with us. Jews who are converted. You also. You are the temple. What is it about the temple? That's where the presence of God is. God dwelling with His people. Brethren, this is what the new covenant is all about. Him being our God. Us being His people. We're not needing to teach one another anymore. We all know Him. There's an intimacy. That's what this is all about. Brethren, I want you to see this. Verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are not anymore. We both have access to the Father. You're not strangers and aliens. Strangers and aliens to what? Well, he was talking about being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You're not alienated from the commonwealth of Israel anymore. You are part of Israel. You are fellow citizens with the Israelites, with the true Israelites, with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus and Himself being the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets, by and large Jews. Christ Jesus, Himself a Jew. He's the cornerstone. The whole structure is being joined together. It's growing into a holy temple. See it. A holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. My brethren, let me tell you something as it relates to eschatology. There's a lot of people out here who insist that we need a thousand year kingdom in this world. If you ask them why, oh yeah, I know, there's, there's Revelation 20 <clears throat> in a book that's highly symbolic and it's only... That, that idea of a thousand year kingdom is only found in that one chapter in a highly symbolic book. But you, you know what? Most of the people out there that insist on this do not insist primarily from Revelation 20. Obviously, they'll go there. The primary reason that they believe that we have to have a thousand year kingdom is to fulfill promises made to Israel Promises that have been given to Israel that they believe have to be fulfilled in this world, in this earth, that are not yet fulfilled and are not yet being fulfilled, they believe. And so, it's going to take this thousand year kingdom for these things to be fulfilled. One of those things 
is the rebuilding of a temple and the temple worship being reestablished. They believe that that is going to take place. This temple, a more glorious temple than anything that this world has ever yet seen. And that sacrifices are going to be once again offered there. And they believe it is absolutely mandatory that you have this thousand years to accomplish this. My brethren, just listen very carefully. Two Old Testament prophets. The first one is Haggai. The later glory of this house. Speaking of the temple. The later glory of this house shall be greater than the former. Says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now you know what? There are people that say there has never been a temple yet built in Jerusalem that had greater glory than Solomon's temple. And when it was rebuilt, there in the days of Haggai the prophet, the old men that had seen Solomon's, they wept over the lack of greater glory in the second. The rebuilding of the temple. What God was saying here about greater glory did not apply to that rebuilt temple. It had to to point to another temple still. That's why people say, well, we're going to need that thousand years and that's when that temple is going to be in use and that's when that worship is going to be offered. Brethren, there was a contemporary of Haggai. He spoke about the temple too. Listen to what he said. Zechariah. Say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, the man whose name is the branch. Who's the branch? That is Christ. He shall branch branch out from his place And he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there, notice this, and there shall be a priest on his throne. How does that happen? How do you get a priest on the king's throne? Well, when the king is high priest also. And the council of peace shall be between them both. I think the both is kingship and priesthood. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam and Tobijah, Jediah and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. Now notice this. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. Where have we heard that kind of terminology? Far off. Those who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ and they are now being constructed into this structure of this holy temple in the Lord. Brethren, if we but have eyes to see, the temple is already being built that is more glorious. Christ is the cornerstone of this temple. And it is those far off. It's us who are being put piece by piece by God into this temple. It's, it doesn't need a thousand years in the future. It's now. He's constructing. And never miss What gives us the right to this nearness of God? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now look, this does not say you have come near. There are places in Scripture that say draw near. This does not say come near. 
This says, you have been brought near. This is something that God does. This is an action of God. There you are, without hope. It's like standing behind a thousand mile thick wall of steel and you're expected to get to the other side. You're in a place that's hopeless. I can't get there. It's an impenetrable wall. I can't get there. But you have to. I can't. There you are without hope in a place, in a position of sin and wretchedness. This million mile wall of steel. It's a wall your sins have built. I can't get there. I can't. But to crush that wall, God crushes His Son. That's what you find here. He exacts from Him His blood. He exacts from Him His life. He exacts from Him payment for your sin to knock that wall down. He doesn't bring me to Himself, brethren. You notice, He doesn't say, well, you've been brought near because He showed you the right way to live. He showed you how to be holy. He doesn't say you get brought near by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, well, you know, you've prayed really well today and you've you've been brought near. Brethren, I'll tell you this, we go all wrong if we forget the blood of Jesus Christ and if we chase after any kind of performance with regards to entering and access. The access, brethren, is by His blood. Remember, with the God with whom we deal. Think about your performance. Think about your prayer this morning. You say, this is the best prayer I had in my whole life. Okay. But you just think about that God. I mean, he, he tells the Jews, Jesus does. We have a God, the look of the eye is just as important to God as, as the act itself. The motive, the intention, we have a God that looks at the heart. We have a God that is altogether holy. A God who says your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Brethren, I know... I know that that is not a description of everything that the Christian can do, but what you can do that's good and what you can do that is acceptable is because you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And all the blemishes get washed by the blood. It's by the blood we have access. Brethren, away with the ideas of performance. Away with them. We have one new man in place of the two. You know how this one man, this one new man, this is the place of the new man. We enter into that holy of holies. We can bow with our faces to the ground. He's altogether holy and we know in and of ourselves we are not worthy. But we are covered by that blood. And our conscience has been washed by that blood. So that our conscience says this, although all hell may break loose against you and condemn you, you are a sinner. Look at how you failed. Look at what you've done. But our conscience is washed by that blood. And it says, yes, this is true. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Brethren, what merit do you have that is sinking sand? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And that is our basis. There must be a sacrifice. You say, why? Because the wage of sin is death. And if God does not exact that wage, then He is unjust. And there must be death if there is sin. Jesus Christ Himself. I mean, you think about it. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am He. They all fall down. You get the idea? Jesus could have just walked away. Peter, don't you know I can call down 12 legions of angels? Why didn't He? Why? Because He had to die. He had to shed His blood. Why? Because we're sinners and He came to save sinners. He did not come to free Himself. He did not come to take the easy road. He did not come to escape the suffering. He came to suffer. He came to give His life a ransom for many. That's why, brethren, one new man in place of the two granted access by the blood by the blood. 
And having that access, God puts us one by one into the wall of the new Jerusalem, into the wall of this new temple, the dwelling place of God. Brethren, honestly, quite honestly, if you're going to say, I'd rather have a physical temple, I'd rather have us go back to Old Testament worship. I'd I'd rather have us go back to Levitical priesthood and to slaughtering of animals over there in Jerusalem. Brethren, that's in in my estimation, that's just that's empty. You can pretty much tell when your eschatology is right if it altogether honors Christ. If you end up with an eschatology that dishonors Christ, be certain it's a bad eschatology. Father, we thank You. We thank You for the access. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank You. Amen.